who will preach a short message about the God that can turn impossibility into possibilities. And then he will give you testimonies of people he prayed for who last week got visas. And then he will collect an offering. When he was saying these things and I sat there, I said in my, in my naive Christian mind, nobody will respond. When the offering bowl, he had ushers. When the offering bowl went through, people who were going in for visa interviews were actually dropping money in. It's called seed. Archbishop Ben Sinidahosa used to say, a cockroach in Nigeria can never be a lion in America. Still a cockroach. There's nothing wrong with going there, but if you have to bend and do all kinds of things, that's where the problem is. Let's finish the scripture. Among my people are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch who? Not a rat. They catch men. Next verse. As a cage is full of birds, so their churches are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and grown rich. They have grown fat. They are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy, they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these sins, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. Their priests ruled by their own power. And my people love to have it so. That's the issue. My people love to have it so. They love the traps that are set. They like to go into those traps. And shout hallelujah, I've been caught. A cage full of birds. And my people love to have it so. This is what troubles me. Is Jesus still Lord of his church? Matthew chapter 16. Verse 15. And he said to them, Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say unto you that you are Peter. In the Greek, it is Petros. You are a small stone. And that's what it means. So don't leave with the understanding or false understanding that the church is built upon Peter. That's Catholic doctrine. This is a play of words here. I say unto you, Peter or Petros, a small pebble. And on this rock, and that word is Petra, it's a large mountain. On this rock, I will build my church. Are you a part of the church he's building? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against who? Against you. That doesn't mean the gates of hell won't move in your direction. But it says it will not prevail. 
Now this is the assurance and the guarantee that the head of the church has given. And in case you don't know, I am not the head of the church. Hello? The head of the church knows himself. I know him. He's Jesus. I am simply an under-shepherd who is subject to the head of the church. And if the head of the church is to build his church, then I must build it the way he wants it built. If not, it is not his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against what he's building. All this demon chasing doctrine is all indicative that he's not the one building the church. Because if it's the one building the church, the gates of hell may come against it. It will not prevail against it. Are you getting what I'm saying? Even some of the songs we sing does not carry the reality of the church. The head of the church is building or Christ is building. Uh, me, I know, go so far. Bible talks about suffering unto perfection. After you suffered for a while, he will say to you. But here the Bible says, don't suffer as a wrongdoer. Go and steal mangoes, they catch you. And lock you up and whip you and then you say god why are you allowing me suffering no in that kind of scenario he would he will watch you he says bear it because there's no scripture you can quote that would deliver you but when you're suffering for righteousness because you've chosen to do right because you've chosen to stand for what is true Take it patiently because it's working for you an eternal weight of glory. I will build my church. It's not necessarily talking about a church building. I keep emphasizing it that the true church is not a building. But buildings are important because without this building and the comfort it provides many of you would not have the patience to hear the word of god uh, an uncomfortable environment can become irritating to us you know physically but the environment it itself is not it it's not the ultimate are you getting what i'm saying it's the lives of the people because you are the church i am the church we all together make up the church of jesus christ Jesus, when he was born, something interesting happened. Wise men came from the east because they had seen his star. There was a young boy who had left the manger because by the time they came, he was grown up. It took at least a year for them to get where he was. So there was no baby in a manger. He was walking. But when they saw him, what did they do? They bowed before him. And they opened their treasure to him. Why would you bow before a child? Would it be because of the age of the child? Or what that child carries? Because these wise men were lords in their own capacity and lords in their own regard and their wisdom established them in all the territories of Bethlehem, Judea and all the territories as well. When they came to bow, they recognized that even though he was a child, he was lord. If wise men will bow, how wise do you think you are? Let's turn to the book of Acts and check a thing or two. Acts 
Acts chapter 2, verse 34. On the day of Pentecost, which is about this season we are in, um, <laughs> chronologically, for David in verse 34, Peter was speaking after the Holy Ghost had come upon the earth, and he said, For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Which Lord was saying to my Lord? When David said that, people thought he was crazy. It's like Isaiah who said, Unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and his wife wasn't pregnant. And people think, is he okay? And David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. He caught a glimpse of heaven where the Lord God turned to his Lord. So who was David's Lord? I know. You, you saw. Saul was king before him. Where did David live? In the Old Testament. Who was his Lord? Jesus. Because in the realm of the spirit. There is no distance. Time fades away. The Lord said to. Whose Lord? To my Lord. Sit. On my right hand. Until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the word Christ is Christus, which means the anointed one. Now, this is Peter's message to all of Israel. That the Lord God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is on the day of Pentecost when they were speaking in diverse languages. And men were looking at them saying, uh, these ones are drunk. And he said, no, we're not drunk with, with wine as you assume. We, we've received something from heaven. This is about the Lordship of Jesus. Many of you do not know this. But the greatest joy that the disciples could ever have had was on the day of Pentecost. Because in Luke chapter 24, Jesus has said to them, Tarry ye in Jerusalem until I uh, endue you with power from on high. He said to them that I will receive the promise of the Father and I would give it to you. Look at Luke chapter 24. That was his word to them. I go to my Father. But I will send unto you the promise of the Father. Luke chapter 24 and verse 45, thereabout, verse 49. Behold, I send you the promise of my Father. I send it upon you. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endured. Endued with power from on high. Next verse. Then he led them out as far as Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Watch this. He said, I will send you the promise of the Father. And he went up. How would you know if he arrived? The only way to know is when the promise of the Father came. So the disciples were waiting. Okay, he went up, but we don't know where he went. But he gave us a word. I will send you the promise of the Father. For him to send the promise of Father, he would need to arrive where the Father is and then send the promise of the Father. Acts chapter 2, the promise of the Father came. They knew beyond the shadow of a doubt. And that's why Peter could say with boldness, David said, uh, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand. Because he knew Jesus that was sitting right there. He knew that he had sent the promise of the Father, which means he made it to heaven. 
it establishes his lordship. He's either lord of all or he's lord of none. Remember that. It's a short journey we need to make today. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, in case you don't know him. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, all principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. That in all things he may have what? He may have the pre eminence which means in all things he wants the lordship England is one of those countries that still in the midst of democracy still has a queen and recognizes a kingdom called the United Kingdom I'll ask you a question that has an obvious answer who is Lord Sovereign over the United Kingdom? Well, I thought he was the Prime Minister. Is the Queen of England. Recently, her grandson got married. William married Kate. And we all watched it. But there were certain things we didn't have the privilege of having because we were not invited to the event physically we were invited through the media but let me tell you how the invitation for that wedding went and it reads the queen her majesty the queen of the United Kingdom commands you to attend the wedding of her grandson, Prince William. That's the invitation. She does not invite you. She does not suggest to you or make you an offer that has probability she commands you to come. Uh, hear this. And when you are commanded, if you like, reply. And say, sorry, I would not be able to make it because I'm going to be making some trip um, out of the country. You are finished. You cannot refuse her command except for one condition you are medically certified as being sick to the point that you cannot make it by virtue of your illness the invitation to her grandson's wedding was not to appeal to your own probabilities of attendance it was a command the queen of england commands you That's an earthly queen. And if you like, say you're not going. Your whole generation will be marked forever. There are certain things you can never amount to in that territory if you refuse without strong medical grounds. 
Nobody understands that language like my general here. Thank you. When the chief of army staff sends for you, do you tell them to tell him that you are busy? She can't even imagine it. No, let's, let's hear from you. Can never happen. Why not? As soon as you hear the command, sir, because of the way we are trained, you are, as soon as you hear that voice, something in you rises towards the invitation. No, I'm not kidding you. You can't think any other thing because inside us is been infused to respond to the voice of a command. Whether the commander is a human being or not. Please stand. No, you, maybe she would preach the rest of this message. I don't know. Because she, she's a general fully fledged. Um, go on. Yeah, so I, I'm just trying to say is, it, it, it's, it's unthinkable. It, 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 the way we are trained, we are trained solishly and bodily. To re no, that's the truth. That's why you can't wear uniform or train. And you can't serve God on train too. That's the truth. And so when, when they train you, they are training your mind and training your body to move in the direction of the command. That's why during parade in training, you don't think about turn to right. All you do is right turn. You just do this. <laughs> they are telling you respond um, from your mind and through your body to the voice of the command. You don't, they don't train you to reason. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't laugh. I'm telling you the truth. That is why we call civilians bloody civilians. Reason. You think you have blood. And so you think with your blood. We don't think. We move. We move before we think. Wow. And, and that is why. And that is why. You cannot have a civilian mind. And wear military uniform. They will discharge you. Before you get to anything. Because when they give you a command. You want to reason it. Your reasoning is dead. But your mind and your body to command is alive. Just like your body is dead spiritually and your spirit is alive. Yes. We will have more. Even her mannerism. She's a general to the core. And I knew her when she was one rope. What was that rank? Flying officer. Flying officer. That's like what? Major? Second lieutenant? No, that's, yeah, second lieutenant. Second lieutenant in the army. She said something to me because she was with my wife over the weekend and she said something interesting. She came in her uniform as a general. She said, Pastor, look at this. She said, I got this by what? Mumu. Mumu life. Mumu life. Just, follow. Just follow. Do you want to say something to that? Yeah, um, like I said to a Pastor, it was actually on a Tuesday. We were supposed to have a meeting. You know, that's it. And, and so I, I just got talking. And I, and I said to the Pastor, people that want to reason things out in the military they can't last that uh, the military life is just the, compared to the life in church you are a sheep and once one sheep moves every we call it heads initiative the, the once one sheep moves that's the leader everybody you won't be asking where are we going there's nothing like that and if you want to make it, let me tell you this. In the military, sir, you can study for PhD. It doesn't affect your promotion. That's why I hold a bachelor's degree, but I command respect more than a PhD holder. Reason, followership. 
In the military, when you are reading your degrees, you are reading for self-development, not for military progression. Wow. All they require you to do is follow. We are posting you to Kanuyesa. Don't be telling them Boko Haram is there. In any case, sir, sir, in any case, what kind... Oh, please, 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 let me flow. In any case, what kind of soldier will you be when you are afraid of going to a battle? It doesn't make sense. So you gain acceptance. You climb in your military career by just following. And I told the, the pastor, you see the general, it's not by speaking Dogon Turenchi. When my superior is talking, I don't say a word. When the man finished, he said, oh, doc, you want to say anything? Sometimes, no, sir, because they are trying you. Too much talk reveals over ambition. I'm telling you. And once you are too ambitious, they cut you off. So I told the pastor, you see the general is mumu life. It doesn't mean that I don't have sense. But when I'm given a command in charge of a troop, I talk. But when I'm under a commander for goodness sake, shut up. And let the commander lead the way. It makes things easier for you. And it makes your acceptability very high. That's why I will get to the peak. Because I'm not ready to argue. There are generals, there are generals. If you're a general, there is a two-star general. Hallelujah. And so because God gave me one star, the man on top of us is four star. So if you get one small star and you now begin to rub shoulders with two star, you will never test it all your life. What's the word? Twali. In all things that he may have preeminence. He gives the command you obey. You don't think it. You obey first. Then you discover <laughs> what he has asked you to do. You know there are so many profound parallels that we find. And let me say this to you. Many Christians cannot experience the grace of God because they violate these simple principles. God's word comes, you see. And let's even think about the theology of what was said. You miss it entirely. The Bible tells the story of a centurion who came to Jesus. Do you want us to look at it? Oh, very instructive. Very instructive. Very instructive. I can't forget what, you know, she said to me. It is Mumu that gave the rank. <laughs> Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 9. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, and as a soldier, and he's a soldier who has 100 soldiers, is leading a troop of 100. Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented, and Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Now, what did he call him? Lord. I recognize you as my Lord. My servant is lying at home dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, again, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Give the command. That's all. Speak the word. Give the command. And my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go. There's no explanation. Go. And 
he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to the servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, As surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. There is more faith in the military than in the church. That's what he's saying. There's more faith in the military than in the church. Your commander tells you, that's Boko Haram's camp. Go! You're saying, it's me he wants to kill. He doesn't care about my welfare. Who will take care of my children? Who will take care of my wife? You don't belong in the army. You're kicked out. That's what church is. That's what we've become. We were at Colonel Zuindila's funeral. And here was this woman. I, I don't know whether she was a general. She, had, she was a general. Wow. Stood in her uniform. And she had a frown on her face. Because while the ceremony was going on by the tomb side, somebody's phone would ring. And I could read it on her face. These bloody civilians. <laughs> Disrupting everything. And she saw so much disruption. And her face was constantly like... You know, she, she was telling me, she said, I don't think I can manage civilians. They have to be trained. Because what is synonymous with civilian life is a lack of discipline. When God says go, you say why? When he says give, you say how? When he says tithe, you say it's not scriptural. It's Old Testament. When he says love your wife, you say no, when she loves me first, she has to respect me then I will love her. And he says, submit to your husband. Do you know what's, ama what's amazing? She's married to a civilian and she has to submit. No be so. I think um, it's just awesome. Uh, uh, the, the work of grace is easier when you understand this command protocol and principles. You see, because of my training, when my husband speaks, sometimes I don't think. I think after having obeyed, when I go home, I say, what did I do? <laughs> but, but you see, I am trained for that. And I want to say this, obedience even makes the work of grace faster. That's right. You get to your destination faster. You see, why God cannot tolerate arguments is there is always urgency to have certain things being done. By the time you finish reasoning, the people are dead. By the time you finish asking questions, souls are lost. For goodness sake, pastor say move. He says, stand up. Stand up! People have gotten healed on their legs by standing. I am one person. I got healed by obedience. And, and I thank God he has hidden plenty of blessings. Enormous blessings in obedience. Because he, he has to train us that way. Bible said Jesus learned obedience. If Jesus learned it, so what are you doing? Mm. One more. <laughs> I've learned a lot from her. And maybe this is where we may, we may just close it today. When she was posted to Abuja, she said, Pastor, I need to come to your office to report to you. I couldn't understand that. So I gave her a time and she came in her uniform as a general. Full regalia. She said, Pastor, we are trained that when we are posted to a location, we go and report to the head of that command. As it is naturally, so is it spiritually. I'm coming to report 
and she gave me a full salute and I collected <laughs> these are that was instructive for me you, you don't you don't get this that that was instructive for me because you learn now I'm not saying this is strange to me but she brought some level of definition to to an order and a principle that I, that I know already you know many times even when you're, you you have mentors and they're making requests from you you want to like eh, mm, I, I will think about it that's rebellion Somebody getting what I'm saying? Saying, well, let's let, we will we'll see how it would work out. But you see, that's the way our minds have been trained to think. And please hear me. No one is going to ask you to do something that's not scriptural. Oh, yes. I mean, when it comes to the kingdom, if I tell you, go to your office and steal money like somebody told me, oh, God. See, don't tell me things because it comes out. He was in a church. And he said his pastor told him because his employment was about to end, he said, steal as much as you can now. True story. It's not. Because in a few days, it's over. You have every right within the kingdom to refuse such. Because our training and doctrine is in righteousness. Accountability enables the flow of grace. Write it down. Accountability enables the flow of grace couple of weeks back I think it was last year sometime I was invited to the Dominion Partners Conference in Lagos at Lateran my pastor said to me I'm inviting you to come he used the word invitation and let me tell you this about me I'm not eager to go preach in places that's, that's it with me I'm not I love what God has asked me to do. So when I receive an invitation, sometimes it feels like a burden. And he said, it is not an invitation, it's a command. I said, yes, sir, I go. I have a father, an earthly father, who is not located where I am. But when I'm making trips, I call him. I'm going to be in the UK. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be there. You think I'm not a man of my own? I am. But it's about accountability. The Bible says, honor your parents in the Lord. The crazy Christians say, honor your parents if they are in the Lord. You know, that's, that's the way it was interpreted. If they are in the Lord, honor them. If they are not in the Lord, dishonor them. That's not what it means. Whether your father is a Shango worshiper or whatever, honor your parents in the Lord. You have to be obedient as long as they are not asking you to violate scripture. So if your father says, marry a second wife, you say, eh. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? But too many times we think we can just live the way we want and we don't realize that there is one who is Lord over our lives. But you see, here is the issue, and, and I'll try and close here. You do not have, as it were, a clean chain. Is that the way to put it? Or a direct access to Jesus in terms of 
instituted authority. So you know what the father has done? He's put authority figures here on earth. He's put your parents. So when you dishonor your parents, you dishonor God. Are you with me? He's put teachers in school. So when you're pupil and you dishonor the authority of that teacher, you dishonor God. He's put a governmental structure in society. When you dishonor or you refuse to obey or submit instituted authority, you are rejecting the lordship of Jesus. That's what it is. Romans chapter 13. It says, let every soul be subject unto higher powers. And that's higher authority. So I don't have to like you. Do you get what I'm saying? I, you, I don't have to like you. You don't have to like me. Because within the church structure, the pastor and the shepherd is that authority structure. You don't even have to like me. You don't have to like your pastor. But it will help you to like him. Because if you don't like him, he can't bless you. Am I talking to someone? The centurion said, just give the command. I know how this thing works. I know how grace flows. I know how power flows. I know how authority flows. Said, I also have men under me. When I say go, he goes. Come, he goes. Sit here, he sits there. And Jesus said, there's more faith in the military than in the church. I've not found faith in Israel like this one. What did he do? He gave the command. And as far as the centurion was concerned, he was done. Many years ago, I gave a command to a young man. You know, there's some very little things. He was driving a vehicle. And he was going to pick up my pastor. And I said to him, as you are going, <laughs> don't go to the left or to the right. Go pick up and drop and let it be done. When he got there to pick up, he got another direction. On his way, he had an accident. I told him, what did I say? Neither turn to the left, nor to the right, but do this exactly. It was God that spared his life because he crashed into somebody's house and the person was lying on his bed when he saw a car coming in. In little things like that, the instructions were clear. All he needed to do was obey. But certain circumstances overrode that and he submitted to it, crushed that car, and the car was such a wreck that it took so much to get it fixed. Is Jesus Lord? Does his command matter? Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Selah. I think this is a good place to end this today. Can we stand on our feet? say to these things.